All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, before I dive into this week's lecture material, I want to talk about uh, assignment one. I literally just completely forgot to do it last week. And I'll be admitted right up front. Um, it is what it is. All right. So for assignment one, it, the, the write up is quite long. That's because there's a very detailed point breakdown of how all the points are assigned when it gets graded. Um, the lab profs are in charge of grading it. And I've actually sent them a spreadsheet. I don't know if they're going to use it, but I sent them a spreadsheet that helps them just do the math. So new groups are a spreadsheet, put in the numbers, the point values, and it just does the math for them. Therefore, overall, across all the sections, it should be graded fairly consistently. Which is good because it's always been a complaint in the past of, you know, one lab prof graded it one way, one lab prof graded it another way. Now we're following a very specific grading scheme and it's been refined a little bit, so it should be good. So you will form groups of two or three, if at all possible, that having been said, the, your group members must be within the same lab section as you. I have to make that clear back when it was, let's say I had all three lab sections, it wouldn't have been a problem because I'm allowed to grade all, all three lab sections. But now the problem is that there's three lab sections, three profs, <coughs> and I am not allowed to grade another prof student and the other prof isn't allowed to grade my students, which brings us to the loggerheads of who's actually gonna be responsible for grading this group. Again, who would be responsible for the demo? Are they gonna to go to one lab section or the other lab section? So the rule is your lab, your group members must be from the same lab section as you. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's caused problems before. It is what it is. Okay. So there will be four files submitted as part of this assignment. Uh, you must submit well, all three files, it's actually four. Um, it's just one kind of goes in with a second thing. Uh, the files are as follows. Um, there's gonna be a design document that you guys are gonna write up. It's gonna sp specify business rules. It's something we haven't talked about yet, but that'll be, we'll be talking about that today. Um, unknowns and assumptions. You're either gonna give it to me as a Word document or as a PDF. Uh, a conceptual ERD in JPEG or PNG format. It's essentially what lab three part A was. So it's not a mystery, that's what it is. A physical ERD exported as a PNG or JPEG, which is basically lab four and the topic of today's lecture. So you will have pretty much everything you need to work on the assignment as, as of the end of today. Um, and then there's an export from the database design tool in text format. Um, I can show you guys that next week, how to do it. All right, so there are three scenarios you can pick from. Um, there's a little disclaimer here, depending on your lecture section, only a single scenario may be pre-selected for you or whatever. It, that, that's just a disclaimer for, you know, if one of the other lecture profs decide, no, everybody's gonna do the same scenario or not. Um, The point would be broken down as follows. There's 14 points for the design document, 22 points for the conceptual diagram, 32, uh, 30 points for physical diagram. All right, so the first part, it's a design document. And you're gonna have a little introduction at the start that basically names off the group members and which scenario you chose. That's, you know, pretty standard. A list, of, uh, a list of entities with a short description of what they represent. So this isn't gonna be a full fat, you know, diagram, all kinds of things. It's basically based on the scenario you picked, these are the entities you identified and you're gonna describe what they do. Um, there's a couple of examples, you know, customer, this entity is used to keep track of customers uh, client information. Um, a list of business rules. They must be valid, clear, and concise. You can include various constraints in here also. Um, so as such minimum quantity, uh, like such as, I'm not saying minimum quantity of business rules is one. 
an example is minimum quantity of one. Um, a list of unknowns. Whenever we start doing design work, like in the real world, and we do a first pass, there's always some unknowns, things you don't know. Based on what you read or what you're given, there's going to be a list of unknowns. It, that's just life. You don't ever have the whole picture at first. Which follows up with a list of assumptions. When you have unknowns, you still need to provide something to the client as a starting point. Therefore, you're going to say, based on these unknowns, these are the assumptions we're going to make. Uh, I've had students in the past ask me, what's the point of including the unknowns and the assumptions? It's there to help the, the prof who's grading you understand what you're thinking. Because if you don't tell us what you were thinking and then you did something kind of weird, you will probably lose points. But if you, you said this is the unknown and this is the assumption we're making on it and then the weirdness actually matches up, we're like, okay, fine. It matches what they were planning. Um, the grading is explained as follows. You can see it's very detailed. Uh, two points for the introduction, four points for the list of entities, one point for the business rules, uh, five, um, sorry, what? there's an extra one in here. I don't know why it's there. Um, there's a typo. I'm going to fix it right now. Where did I see that? There we go. And there's where the number, the adding up was screwed up. All right. Um, Five points of the business rules broken down in three one one. Uh, you got adequate rules. They're clear and concise and they're valid. Um, two points for the unknown and the assumptions broken down as follows. Um, and a point for, did you give me the right kind of file? Yes, we are giving you one point for free for actually giving us a Word document or a PDF. There's a reason why we're giving you guys points for free for some of this stuff. Because in the past, people don't listen. Therefore, here's the carrot. The conceptual diagram. You're going to draw a conceptual diagram of based on what you've come up with. Um, all the identities that you identified, uh, you should at least identify the candidate key or the identifier that you've picked. Uh, relationships are defined by the as defined by the business rules. In other words, you know, you're just going to say something like a customer can have many orders. You're going to actually have the right crow's foot at each end. Um, 10 points for the relationships. You can read the breakdown. Uh, physical diagram. You are going to provide a physical diagram using MySQL Workbench. We're going to be talking about physical diagrams today. And there's a few things that that it required, is it properly normalized? We're gonna be talking about norm normalization next week, but normally that's when you're working with existing data more than when you're coming up with something from scratch. Uh, includes all the tables, relationships are all defined right, has primary keys and foreign keys, um, has any derived attributes removed. Um, if you decide to leave a derived attribute behind, you have to explain why you have you left the defined the derived attributes, uh, appropriate data types and lengths, making everything a VARCAR 255, I'm going to be talking about data types today a bit, making everything a VARCAR 255 or integer is not a valid solution. Not everything is an integer. Not everything is a VARCAR 255. Um, a constraint that is defined that is neither a primary key or a foreign key, uh, that would be like quantity greater than zero. You can look at the, up how to do that. Um, a label that identifies who created the diagram, all the group member names must be on there. And you also submit an SQL exported from the design tool. Um, and there's another typo, man, whoever copied this into our shells did a shit job. Essentially, I can run these um, SQL files through a code analysis tool. So I can see how many people copied each other. <laughs> Because it'll say, hey, this file is like 98% the same as this file. And that tells me I have two groups that submitted the same work. So that's why you're going to submit the SQL file. It's, you know, to stop that kind of stuff. Yeah. Two to three. Yep. It's at the top of the instructions. And I did say it already. Um, and as you can see, the breakdown of all the points, including two points for did you give me the right files? So literally in this assignment, you got four points off the top just for, did you give me the right shit? 
All right, I'm going to talk about the scenarios really quick. Scenario one is very detailed. It gives you some very straightforward information. It gives you some sample what the data looks like. These are outputs. This would have been something that we would have done in the late 80s, early 90s, essentially. What we used to do is when we were migrating one person's system to another system, we couldn't take the application across. Not like today where, you know, most of it's running as a web app or, you know, software as a service, like, you know, running on a cloud service. You couldn't take something that was running on an IBM Unix system and put it on a Windows machine. It just wouldn't work. So we literally had to rewrite the whole application. And what we used to do is we'd have sample output, we'd have the give us the business rules and we'd run from that. So this is very realistic. It's simplified, but it's very realistic. Um, the business rules are practically write themselves on this one. Scenario one is the most straightforward scenario. Like once you take the time to read it, you'll realize that it's very straightforward. I'm gonna go to scenario three before I do scenario two. Scenario three is just a redo of a very common assignment that, that's been floated around for years in all kinds of institutions of education. Um, this one here has very little structure. It allows you to flex your creative juices more than the other ones in the sense that you are being given information. However, what makes this one challenging is that the information is begin, being given to you by non-technically savvy people. You're writing a database for a school system. Now, I don't know how many of you have experienced it, but imagine trying to get the receptionist at your high school to tell you what they need in a software system, or the principal, or the teachers. They know what they want, but it's up to you to figure out how to put it together. Some of the stuff will overlap. Some of the stuff makes no sense. But that's, you know, how that one works. It's not terrible. And it's not that complex as long as you think it through. And then we get the scenario two, the trap. Everybody, I, every time I've had a group take scenario two, they always end up feeling overwhelmed and wish they picked a different scenario. Okay, the local pizza shop doesn't like its current database track customers. It wants you to create a new one. What did they provide to you? A menu to show you what kind of stuff they sell. And a sample receipt. This used to be a real pizza shop in the West End. It's probably the best pizza shop in the West End. They sold it off about two years ago and it's gone to shit since. Um, but it was probably the best pizza in this part of town. And yes, I actually did order pizza so I could have a receipt for this. I ordered a couple of pizzas. Um, so you will see that it provides you a menu that shows you the kind of stuff that sells and a receipt that shows you basically what the transactions look like. A lot of people underestimate this one because the reason I picked a pizza shop is pizza shops have the most complex orders of any fast food delivery service. Most of you might not realize, this. oh, I'm going to go and get, uh, I don't know, I'm going to order stuff from the Chinese place down the road. You pick number six. You might say no mushrooms. Number six is going to show up at your door. <laughs> Pizza shop orders, I want a thin crust, extra sauce, double cheese, with these four toppings, well done. That's a lot of moving pieces. And not only that, they also have the pre-canned stuff also. So most places when you order takeout, except for pizza shops, the menu items don't really change. You order yourself some butter chicken, guess what you're going to get? Butter, chicken, rice. It's pretty much how it comes. Pizza shops aren't like that. So it makes for a significantly more complex database. And people forget, don't realize how complex it can be. 
Um, unless you've worked at a pizza shop. Anybody here ever work at a pizza shop? She was smiling. She was smirking the entire time I was talking. I knew. Good chance she's experienced it. Yes, pizza shops are complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces. Um, that's why I call it the trap. It's a really fun one. It's a really good thought exercise. But it's really easy to get overwhelmed. All right. Those are the scenarios. What you're going to do is you're going to pick one. You're first, you're going to pick your group. Number one. Number two, you're going to pick your scenario and you're going to start working on it with your group members. Um, this is where I'm going to put in the disclaimer. I'm not a fan of group work because of the politics. The number of times I've had my group members did nothing. Or why did I get a zero? Group member C was said they submitted it. <laughs> group member C didn't get off his ass and do shit. So all of you got zero because nobody submitted anything. I hate those politics, but it's a requirement of this course that you guys take do group work. Because you have to do group work when you go out in the real world. Very few companies only have one software developer. So it's life. And the final disclaimer about the assignment before I dive into today's lecture. It must be demonstrated. So the last week of labs before the break, whenever the hell the break is, that last week, you're going to go to lab and you're going to demonstrate. Um, different profs do things differently, so I'm not even going to say how long it takes. Um, my demos usually under five minutes a group. We're doing that because we need to prove that you did the work. And you didn't get somebody off Chegg to do it for you. It's happened. That's why we start, we put in this rule. So the rule is the, the, a quorum of the group must show up. So if it's a group of three, at least two of you must be there, preferably all three. But with, you know, people getting sick and stuff like that, it doesn't always go as well as you'd expect or buses or weather or whatever. No demo. Automatic zero. Why? Because at that point, you didn't show up to defend your work. That's basically what it is. You basically, you shot it into the, out to the dark. Last semester, I gave two zeros because people didn't bother show up. And I had one person say, well, why did I get a zero? My group member said they were going to go demo. I'm like, well, they didn't come, so you know. Maybe you should have come to class that day. And what's worse, they were even in the school because I saw them like 10 minutes before class. So they just decided not to go to the, lab, to the lab for the demo, which led me to think that they probably didn't do the work themselves. Okay. Any last minute, any questions about this before I dive into today's 41 slide lecture? <laughs> which is why I usually try to do it previous week because it's always only a one hour lecture. And I forgot. Yeah. Yes, that's what I said. Yeah, you must be in the same lab section. If you are unable to find group members, but you do want to work in a group, let me know sooner than later. Two days before it's due is not the time to tell me that you don't have a group member. It has to be the same lab section. So, yeah, your, your case, Wednesday, 5 o'clock, those people. No, no, no. You guys have basically everybody, for example, in your lab at five o'clock on Wednesday, everybody in there is in this lecture. No, there's two other lab sections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has to be the same people as your five o'clock, in your case, five o'clock. And I think there's somebody who's got grace. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, there's three lab sections in this lecture. Okay, any other questions? Going once, going twice, three times. Okay, now to get into this week's uh, lecture, we're going to be talking about transforming you basically your conceptual diagrams into physical diagrams. Oh, here we go again. 
There we go. Okay. A database designs a set of specifications to be implemented as a database on a database management system. You take a data model or an ERD and you convert it into a database design, which is also an ERD. <laughs> Except the regular conceptual ERD is cross-platform because it really has nothing to do with the underlying technology. The database design or the physical ERD is usually database system specific so that you'd be designing it specifically for MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, one of those. We've already spoken about conceptual design. Uh, I'll mention really quick logical design on the way by, and then we'll get into physical design. Um, what we're going to be talking about in this lecture is basically a logical design plus physical design elements, such as data types. Because realistically, the only difference between a logical design and a physical design is one has data types and one does not. So they're essentially the same thing. Um, depending on what textbooks you refer to, some textbook make a big deal about the logical design and just don't really talk much about physical design. And other ones barely talk about logical design and spend a lot of time on physical design. And after you've gone, uh, like we've been through four different textbooks for this course over the last 15 years. After four textbooks, you just realize that in the end, all the, all the authors are saying the same thing. Logical designs are basically physical designs, except, you know, data type situation. So a few common tasks in database design. So you're going to gather uh, stuff such as business rules. You're going to do some normalization and diagramming. We're going to talk about normalization next week because it's a painful topic that requires a fresh slate going into it. Um, but we are going to talk about business rules and diagramming today. So a business rule is a statement of policy. And this, I'm just going to read you the, the, the official definition. A business rule is a statement of policy and it describes operations, what a process validates, but does not describe how a policy is enforced, conducted, nor how is it implemented. All right. In a second, I'll be going through specifically what, what that means. But why do we need business rules? Uh, the reason business rules are set up is to enable an organization, organization to achieve its goals. Like anything else, Businesses have rules, they have guidelines, they have procedures, and all those things are in place so that the business hopefully succeeds. Um, business rules can apply to people, processes, corporate behavior, and systems. Uh, example, computers in an organization. So here's an example of a business rule. An organization called ABC Tech may have a policy to give customers who purchase items worth 5000 and above in one year period in one year period a discount on their other purchases so the rule can be stated as if a customer spends over 5000 in a one year period then give 10% discount on each item purchased by the customer um can i think of any companies doing this currently no uh, most companies have stopped doing those kinds of discounts. Uh, the only ones you'll really see this with are uh, corporate accounts at business supply stores and stuff. So, like a, Nokia here in Ottawa probably has an account with, say, Staples. And if they buy, you know, 10,000 pens, they probably get a price break on the 10,000 pens. Those kinds of things still exist, but you don't tend to see that very much at the consumer level anymore. Um, and in actual fact, this isn't a particularly good business rule. It is a business rule in the sense of it states something. The problem is, is that so that's one of the problems with this rule is it's it's vague, it's complex, and it actually has too much detail. Um, so a business rule is the foundation of a data model. They represent the language and structure of an organization. And they're usually derived from business policies, procedures, events, and functions. 
Uh, business rules are basically constraints that are specified in business rules. And they provide a formal way to understand the organization by stakeholders. Okay. So business rules will determine data and creation, storage, retrieval, and data administration. Business role rules are usually known as constraints. Constraints are represented on the ERD. The reason I said this was a pretty terrible rule is you can't represent this on an ERD. There's no way to put this in an ERD. Because realistically, we're, we're using actual numbers. It's integral to the design of the database, and it's based on the policies. Okay, this is actually the important part of the whole blah, blah, blah about business rules. And of course, it's going to be almost impossible to read if you're past a certain distance, but the slide deck I'm using is the same. I didn't change the one on Brightspace, so it's there. A business rule must be decorative. And I didn't pronounce that right, but we're going to go with it. A business rule is a statement of policy, and it describes what a process validates, but that doesn't describe how the policy is enforced, conducted, or implemented. So that first business rule was literally saying, you know, this is how it's going to be used. Basically saying, this is how it's going to be implemented. You know, they spend five grand, they get 10% discount for the rest of the year. So a proper business rule should be very clear. In other words, an order must contain one or more items. That's a good business rule. It describes the process and the validation that, you know, to place an order, there must be at least one thing in the order. But it doesn't say how that's being enforced. Is it being enforced by the application? Is it being enforced by a nosy manager? Is it being enforced by the database? We don't care. But it has to be clear, precise. A rule must have only one interpretation among all interested people, and the meaning must be clear. So when you list off a business rule, everybody involved in deciding what the business rules are must all understand it the same way. Only one interpretation. Again, that rule that I did a few, uh, couple of slides ago, how many, you had like three different questions on that one rule. I bet you somebody else in this room would have thought it differently. It had multiple interpretations. On the other hand, if I go back to my original business rule, an order must have one or more items in it. I think pretty much everybody will understand what that means. Everybody involved will understand what that means. Atomic. A rule is indivisible, yet sufficient. That means that the rule doesn't contain multiple rules. It is a single rule. It cannot be broken down into smaller pieces. Again. An order must contain one or more items. There's no way to break that down. It's self-contained. On the other hand, that rule is so long that you could theoretically break that down into two rules. Consistent. A business rule must be internally and externally consistent. In other words, it, if you apply the rule to the database, it must be consistent inside the database and outside the database. Expressible. A business rule must be stated in natural language without misinterpretation. That's saying that there should be no jargon in a business rule. That means it's stated in plain, whatever your base language you're working in. So in this room, plain English. No fancy words, unless really the fancy word applies to a specific process. And it can't be misinterpreted. That means that you could give the business rule to the receptionist. And if she reads it, she should be able to understand it. It's a really good way to decide if your business rules are good is to give them to someone that doesn't understand all the processes. But if they can understand the rules, they're good rules. They might not understand the process behind the rule, but at least they can understand the rule. Distinct. A business, business rules are not redundant. You can't write the same business rule twice with an if statement inside of one of them. Like that other one had a freaking if statement in it. But a business rule may refer to other rules. An order must have one or more items in it. A 
the items, the one or more items in an order must be valid and exist in the database. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with a system where people just get to key in, a, you know, oh, they bought six bags of dirt for $22 and they literally type that into the invoice. You don't see that very much anymore, but there's still cases where people do custom jobs. Big air quotes on custom jobs. Um, accountants really hate that crap. But that was really common 15, 20 years ago. But that would be a valid business rule that refers to the other business rule. Like it's allowed to refer to another rule, but it has to be consistent unto itself. So when you see a test and it talks about business rules, very likely the questions are going to be based on this slide. The other stuff is just fluff. This is what's important to know about business rules. So for the assignment, when you're going to be talking about business rules, you're getting an idea of what they should be like at this point, you know. Um, a customer must have a phone number and an address. That is a valid business rule because, for example, if you're it's a pizza shop, you need to know where to send the food and you need to be able to call them if something's gone horribly wrong. Therefore, that makes it, it's a business rule that's going to make those fields in the database not null. That's a constraint because they're required. I'll be talking about null and not null in a few minutes. But that's, you know, what business rules are for. It helps guide the final design of the database on how it's actually going to run. Okay. Any questions about business rules before I continue? We used to have a prof that spent half a lecture just on business rules because he thought they were so important. They are important, but they're not half, they're not an hour important. Okay, step one, to transform a data model into a database design. So when you've got your ERD, like lab three, for each table, you're gonna turn an entity into a table. So if you've got an ERD, conceptual ERD, for every box, you'll have a matching table in your physical diagram. You are going to specify the primary key. You're free to use surrogate keys if you want at this point. This is when you're allowed to start creating surrogate keys. Uh, you may need to specify alternate keys. Uh, usually alternate keys become something called an index. Um, not something, I don't think we're barely going to talk about indexes this semester, but it's there. Then you're going to specify the properties for each column. So each attribute becomes a column or a field. And you are going to find the following things. The null status. Is it null or not null? By When we say by null or not null means, not null means you must supply a value. So if you try to add a row in a database table that has a column marked not null, you must supply a value for that or it will return an error. Null means the value is optional. That means it defaults to no value. So if we go back to the example of a student, you have a primary phone number. That is probably not null. You might have secondary phone number, which is nullable because maybe not everybody has a second phone number or a third phone number. Or you might have primary email, secondary email. Not everybody has two email addresses. That's nullable. A data type. I'll be actually talking about data types a fair amount. Well, enough. Um, by now, you guys have been doing a bit of Java now for four weeks. You've come across something called data types, I hope. Right? String, integer, Boolean. That's pretty much real. You know, those are basically the, the basic data types you find in most C-like languages. Um, database servers, on the other hand, have an insane amount of data types. Because over the years, people said, we really got to come up with appropriate data types for all the different kinds of data. And different database servers will have different data types available to you. Some of them will have more than others. Some have extra data types because their original design was stupid. Now they're, they're stuck with these old data types. MySQL. 
as a prime example of a database with really strange data types included for the ride. Uh, a default value. For example, um, you could have a Boolean field. So you guys know what a Boolean is, right? True, false. You could have a default to true. So every time a record gets added to the database and you don't include that column in the list of values being put in, it'll automatically set that column to true. It's a really good way to minimize the amount of interaction with the database. Also make sure that certain things are um, set. Because the strange things about booleans and databases, I, I'll bring it up now. Booleans and databases, interesting relationship. Uh, database servers that actually properly support booleans. We actually have trinary state booleans. So most people are used to thinking of booleans being binary, right? True, false. What happens if it's null? True, false, I don't know. So therefore, booleans in the database server are trinary. In other words, they have three states. Therefore, you might want to set a default value to true or false to make sure you never have the I don't know situation. Um, but sometimes I don't know is actually the valid situation where you add a record to the database that then an end user has to fill in and they have to say, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree. But until they've you know, hit the bool, the checkbox or not, you don't know. Um, data constraints, if applicable. Um, there's a few cool things you can do in some database engines. Uh, MySQL doesn't do a very good job of them. Um, you can say this value of this field must be more than five, things like that. Um, honestly, I've never used them. Been doing this for 26 years and I've never used them. I've tried to use them twice and it blew up my face both times. So I've decided I'm going to stick to making the application make these these defaults, not the database server. Because there was a time where we had a default value and suddenly a business process changed and everybody forgot that the database actually had a hard-coded, you know, check constraint built into it. And it just started blowing up and people were like, oh, I don't know why it's blowing up. And then I literally had to go analyze log files and watch for that error. I'm like, what was I thinking? That was like 16 years ago. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you verify the normalization. That, like I said, we're going to talk about normalization next week. Uh, it's essentially just making sure that the tables are structured properly. That's what that means. Um, then you're going to create the relationships. You can create the relationships between the strong entities, the ID dependent entities, and uh, the strong and the weak entities as applicable. Uh, there may be um, mixed relationships in there. Those are rare. Um, if you did the design work properly beforehand, you shouldn't have a mixed relationship. It basically means that you have um, multiple relationships that go from two different the two entities, but you have multiple relationships between them. It happens. There's valid use cases for that. But you tend to try to avoid those unless you really have to have it. Um, you specified logic for enforcing minimum cardinality, one to one, many to one, one to many, many to many. Uh, we're actually going to talk about resolving many to many in a moment. Okay. So, using the square entity format, not the Chen diagram or the one with the diamonds and the circles and the boxes, but you know, the uh, database design software people were too lazy, so they used a box for con for conceptual. If you look on the one on the left, and then you look to the one on the right, what's the only difference between them? There's a key. Somebody defined a primary key. Suddenly we went from a conceptual object to a logical slash physical table. Because we went from a, we have an identifier to having a key. Um, which is, that which is going back to, you know, I discussed this, how a couple of weeks ago, how the design software people decided to be lazy. They didn't want to have to write two different sets of graphical handlers. So they just literally say, here's the box. Here's the box with the key. Now you got a table. Um, so at this point, we went from a conceptual to a logical. 
So we're going to talk about the primary key for a moment. Um, an ideal primary key is short, numeric, and fixed. We try to use numeric keys whenever possible. Um, even if during the conceptual diagramming stage, you said, hey, we've got this candidate key, but it's actually kind of long and it's alphanumeric and it's kind of gross. Realistically, you should be thinking of not using that and just use a surrogate key. Um, theoretically, surrogate keys are ideal, but apparently they have two disadvantages. They have no meaning to the users. But realistically, who cares? The user shouldn't care what the IDs are anyways. They're not inputting them. Um, the second one, though, is true. When the data is shared across multiple database systems. So most retail locations, let's go with Loblaws, for example. They have a server in the building with their current stocks and all their daily transactions then you will have the other Loblaws. Can you shut that door for me? That one is closed. Damn, they're loud. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it sounds like they're standing right next to me. So that's why I thought the door was had popped back open. Thanks, though. <laughs> All right. The, so, for example, you think about Loblaws. And they got their database, their server running in at College Square here. Then you got the Loblaws on Merivale, and you got a Loblaws South Keys, you got Loblaws in Canada. They each have their own database server running. But usually, every, once a couple of times a day, they will take a snapshot of their data and upload it to the home office, wherever that happens to be, Toronto somewhere. The problem is then we have is that if they're using surrogate keys, we may get key collisions. So you'll have two transactions, 142 for the day. And how do you fix that? Then you tend to have a prefix. So you, your all your keys are all compound keys on all the important tables. You'll have, you know, a location ID plus the surrogate key. So the surrogate key will still be, you know, go up incremented every day. But the first half, it won't change. So surrogate keys are great, except for when you have basically what they call a multi-tenant database where you have the same database in multiple locations where at some point all the data gets piled into one thing. Um, a good, another good example for you guys might understand. How many of you have looked at a personal check recently or written a check? God, through I'm getting old. Okay. How about looking at a direct deposit slip? You know, you get the little paper printed from the bank to let you get your money deposited. Rob. You'll notice something has a branch number. And then an account number. The thing is that your account number can exist in multiple banks. Your real account number is your account number plus your branch number. Because banks at one time, each bank was monolithic. They had their own database. Once a day, they uploaded today's transactions, including all the account information, but it, they needed to not intersect the account numbers. So all the account numbers are actually prefixed with a transit number, which is also known as the branch cool database things that you don't realize why things are the way they are. Um, so each account number has a bank number, a transit number, also known as the branch number, and then your actual account. You know, they, it's, it was done that way so that they can upload all the data once a day to their main offices. Nowadays, the whole data center is like replicating across the whole country, right? So it's not quite like that, but it's cool. All right, so we have something called alternate keys. So the term candidate key and alternate key are synonyms. Candidate keys are alternate identifiers. So you've created your primary key, but while you were doing your design phase, you came up long and said, well, these could be actually used to identify a person. They're not perfect, but they could be used to identify someone. So those, those are known as alternate keys. Um, and you'll notice two samples here. You have an employee with an employee number and email address is alternate key one. And you'll see it's written as 1.1. It's basically alternate key one, component one. If we look at the customer one, you'll see that the name is alternate key one, component one. 
and city is alternate key one, component two. So you'll see AK11, AK12, and the email address is AK21 because it's alternate key two, component one. Now, this is where I'm going to put in a full disclaimer. I've never used this notation. The textbook author for the textbook we are using decided this was an interesting concept to introduce. 26 years, I've never seen this. And I don't think I've ever seen it in any of the midterms. When I get the copy of the midterm, I'll let you guys know if you need to worry about this stupid notation. But it's there. Um, realistically, alternate keys would become indexes later. So indexes are a structure in the database to make things go faster. So to make querying certain pieces of information faster. And I'm pretty sure we covered that actually in the last the last real lecture of the semester, what they actually are. Uh, but basically anything that would be an alternate key would become an index. It just makes things go faster when you're searching against them. Okay, null status. So at this point in time, we now have our table and we are going to specify whether things are null or not null. Not null means it the, data, the value is required. Null means you can add the record without it. So we have an employee table. Employee number is not null because a primary key is always not null. Because it identifies the row. So how can it be null if it identifies the row? If it can't identify the row if it can be null, therefore it's always not null. An employee's name is not null. Apparently the phone number is nullable. The email address is nullable. They marked email address as an alternate key. Great. Hire date, not null, because we need to know when they got hired. Uh, review date is nullable. Employee code is nullable. Now, the reason why the phone number and the email address in this case are nullable is means that they've been hired. They haven't been assigned a company phone number or a company email address yet. So it goes into the system. Once it goes through the IT department, their phone, their company phone number, if applicable, will happen. Their company email address will happen. Their employee code will probably happen once it goes through HR, that kind of stuff. Data types. Okay. We have generic data types. And I always encourage all of my students, use the generic data types whenever possible. Now, the only thing is, is that this slide was created by someone that was comfortable with Microsoft SQL Server. So they threw in two data types in here that aren't actually generic. Um, and I'll point them out as we go by. So first we have car, N. It's a character field. It means it'll take alphanumeric character. Basically anything you can type on a keyboard can go into this field. N means length. So if you go car 10, it will hold up to 10 characters, no more. And car was the original alphanumeric data type in database systems. It was the, the OG. And the thing about car is it always occupies the same number of bytes in the database. You guys have learned about bits and bytes yet? Okay, good. By the number of bytes, I mean, so you say car 10. So you got a field that's 10 characters long. And I you put in the letter A. It will still occupy 10 bytes. Even though the letter A might only use up one byte. It's like that because way back in the day, computers were slow. How many of you have ever seen, because every year I say this, there's fewer and fewer in the group. Ever watch a movie where they had like the big tape to tape data centers, you know, the, the tapes are rolling and tapes are rolling and, you know, they're typing on a on this monstrous sized computer and the tapes start rolling. Yeah, one person, yay, I'm feeling older by the minute. When it was the car length, it actually knew how far to move the tape for that field. Therefore, if it was always 10 bytes, it knew it needed to move so many millimeters for 10 bytes which is why the character fields always use the same amount of room on the database. A few years later, 
<laughs> Somebody says, this is stupid. It's taking up too much room. I know I'm saying 10 bytes when we, you know, my phone takes a picture that's like four megabytes, right? Four megabyte JPEG, but 10 bytes is too much. You got to take into account that, you know, the first, some of the very first hard drives were measured in five megabytes of space. It's not a lot of room. Um, I know my, during my co-op, when I did my co-op when I was in college, uh, the company I worked for had a really old IBM System 36 system. It, the architecture has nothing to do with the story. But they had a $25,000 hard drive that they bought in 1984. So that was 12 years before I started my co-op. It was that tall, that wide, this big. It held 20 megabytes. Three pictures from my phone. Well, six pictures from my phone would have filled that whole hard drive and probably taken two hours to write. So somewhere along the way, somebody says, well, we can't keep wasting 10 bytes with every record of data. So they came up with something called VARCAR, variable character. N. So you can go VARCAR 10. It means it'll hold up to 10 bytes. But it'll only hold the number of characters plus a termination bit. So there'll be like a special set of bits that get written to the disk or whatever. So if you put in the letter A, it'll occupy one byte plus like three bits or something. I don't remember exactly. Each database server does it a little bit differently. Basically, there's a demarcation point. So when it's reading the record, it goes byte one, byte two, byte... Oh, there's no more bytes. Here you go. This is all we need. So it's only ever occupying basically the number of characters you've defined, you've put in. Oh, it's a great space saver. And it's gone to the point where modern database systems now are so fast that there is no reason to use a car, except if you are trying to follow proper design theory, where you should always use car fields on fields of data that always have the same amount of data in it, such as a postal code. will always have six characters in Canada. So therefore, if you're doing a Canadian-only database, you'd use a car six, because it's always gonna have all six characters in it, unless it's null. Um, you'll notice that I skipped the end car and the end var car. Those are Microsoft SQL Server specific data types. Those stand for nationalized car, nationalized var car. Now, when we talk about specific languages, such as Chinese, Japanese, I'm picking on the Asian languages right now. Most of, they have so many characters, they don't actually have an alphabet, right? They have something else. I don't remember what it's called exactly, but basically each of their characters represents a word or a concept. Then they've got the little, you know, things they put on it to emphasize certain meanings. And I know I'm super simplifying it. I'm well aware. But the problem is that some characters in their let's call it alphabets, can occupy two or three bytes. So if you go car 10, maybe at most you'll get three characters in, not n characters. Therefore, they came up with the n car, which means number of characters regardless of the size of bytes. So that's what that's for. Um, Different database servers handle this stuff differently. Like MySQL and Postgres use UTF-8 instead so that all the characters are stored in UTF-8. That means it doesn't care about the number of bytes for the character. It's always about how many characters it is. Um, date, time, there's also usually a date time or timestamp field. Uh, those are self-explanatory. They hold dates, they hold times. Integers, you guys know what an integer is, right? Okay, good. Um, Decimal and numeric are aliases of each other. They're synony synonyms. They hold numbers with decimal places. You'll notice, and there's money. Money is just a weird one. Um, I tell people stay away from the money data type because it's not implemented the same in all database servers, so you might get unexpected results. But basically, decimal and numeric are there to um, supply numeric precision 
you'll notice there's also a few other data types you'll find in most systems. Um, you'll have real, float, those kinds of things. Uh, but a lot of data, unless you're dealing with scientific numbers, you'll actually want to use a decimal or a numeric. And the way it's defined is this. You'd go... Length, precision. So let's if I go 10, comma 2 on my numeric. This is stating that my number can be Now you guys probably didn't hear me counting because I suck at just writing numbers. It's going to get recorded. It's great. Okay. Here's my 10. This is my two. So it's saying that this is a number that is a maximum of 10 digits long with two reserved for decimal places. It's a really useful data type because it does the rounding for you. Because as I've learned over the years, one thing students suck at is rounding especially once you get past three or four decimal places. They just look at the next three, go, I must be rounding up or rounding down, and then they get it wrong. I've actually had students get questions wrong because of that on some old tests. So numeric and decimal do the same thing. Number of digits total, how many reserved for decimal place? In our employee table here, we've got employee name var car 50, phone number set as a car 15, cool. Uh, because probably we're storing the phone number the same way every single time with the same formatting. Therefore, it's always 15 characters. Uh, email address. I don't know why they did and Varkar, but Varkar 100. Um, as a person that's done this from experience, 100 is the bare minimum for email. By the way, go for 150. Just for argument's sake. Uh, I have stories on that. Um, on that particular one. Just check my time. See if it's worth the story. Yes. So. And then hire date's a date, review date is a date, employee code, they did a car 18. <clears throat> Why should you make email address 150? Ottawa, and that would have been about 25, 26 years old, called digital equipment. Uh, unless you've been in the, you were born and raised in Ottawa, that probably means very little to you. Um, digital equipment was bought by Compaq and then bought by HP when HP and Compaq merged. They were, basically one of the big high-tech employers in the Ottawa area, just so you have a little background. I get hired in to modernize uh, one of their call tracking systems. They had one that was written several years ago, and it was showing its age already. And the person had designed it originally with an email address of Varkar, Varkar 75, I think it was, because he thought, you know what, that's more than adequate. Even though, you know, the standard for an email address is actually quite long. But he says, I've never seen anything longer than 75, so good enough. Flash forward about a year and a half, and I get one of the guys using that call track software, put his customer on hold, and called me. Because I was the guy writing the software. I was tech support for them. Go figure that one out. And the guy goes, I can't get it to save. I go, why? He goes, I'm getting a weird error about the email address. I'm like, okay. And I go, okay, hang on, I'll come over there. I'm going to take a look. So at that point in time, the person pulls up the customer's name, and I'm like, damn. It was a French name. And the particular client worked at the government of Ontario. So she had a hyphenated first name. And it wasn't like Joanne. It was like... I don't remember exactly. It was like Jeanne Mirabel. Okay, that's a lot of letters already just for our first name. Back then, the government of Ontario, in their infinite wisdom, as you can see, they're still wise, but in their infinite wisdom was a person's email address was their first name dot their last name. Cool. She was from Quebec and married. Now, some of you in here have no idea what that means. 
in Quebec, it is common for when women get married to get a hyphenated name. They get their last name, their original last name, hyphenated with their husband's last name. And there's like rules about which part of the hyphenated name that gets used. And she had a very long set of last names. She had one of which was almost the same as mine, but she had Boudreaux. That's, you know, B-O-U-D-R-E-A-U-L-T, 11, dash. And her other one was 12 letters long. Okay, so at this point, we're all sitting at almost 30 characters, 35 characters just for her name, at. And back then, we didn't have the at Ontario.ca. It was at department name. Watch. French version of the department name. Dot O-N dot G-C. Sorry, dot, uh, dot, dot O-N dot G-O-V. So, whatever her name was, at Ministry of Natural Resources, dash, Ministry of Resources Naturelles, she blew right through the 75 characters. There was, that was an emergency patch that day. <laughs> And I had to fix the database and update the application, push an update to the application to everybody because I was a client server application, so it ran on their machines. That day, I made the rule to myself, 150 characters for emails. I don't care. And what's worse is now email addresses are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Like my Gmail address is surprisingly long. But really, most people, it's like, babygirl72 at gmail.com I'm a superstar 12. You know, email addresses actually have gotten a lot shorter than they used to be. And then you've got the agent font email address, which is like 12675665 at 111Q. Because you can't put Asian characters as part of your email address. <laughs> it doesn't work. So they, their email addresses are like a bunch of numbers at a bunch of numbers. So that's my rule about email addresses and my little history lesson. All right. I got two slides of common data types in my SQL. I'm just going to skip over them really quick. Um, we have a bunch of numeric ones, including bit, which is a number from 1 to 64. We have a tiny int and an unsigned version of said tiny int. Basically goes from zero to 255 or minus 128 to 127 because the negative sign takes up one space in the database. So if you make it unsigned, you get to do bigger numbers. Um, Booleans. MySQL does not have Booleans. You feed it a Boolean, it will turn it into a tiny int one. No, and it's something that MySQL doesn't even support anymore. Uh, in the next version of MySQL, they're dropping support for tiny int one. So I'm hoping they actually bring in proper Booleans. Because the problem was in every other database server that supports Booleans, we have yes, no, I don't know. Cool. I already went over that one. MySQL had zero to nine and I don't know because it's a one position integer. Therefore, you literally had zero to nine states of yes, no. It's like asking your significant other, what do you want to have for supper tonight? I don't know. One of these five things. Not just one thing. So that's yes, pretty terrible for that. Uh, we have small ints, medium ints, and ints. Uh, you can see the size of those numbers. I'm not going to even try to read those off. Uh, they have float or reels, and we have double precision. Those are used for scientific purposes. They're almost never used in business. Um, we have date, date time, time stamp, time and year. Uh, date is a date. Date time includes the date and the time. Shocker. Timestamp includes date and time, but it has a different range of values. And it, in MySQL, it does something weird. Uh, it also automatically sets it. Every time you touch the record, it automatically updates itself. Um, very few people use it. Time is just time. Year, literally, it's just a range of years. Uh, we have car, var, car, blob. And I always say, say no to blobs. Blobs are terrible things. Uh, binary large objects, you're literally putting binary data in a database. Uh, for a while, everybody thought it was the coolest thing ever. I'm going to make a database, and I'm going to put the files in the database. You want to talk about bloat? 
Oh, I've got this record. It occupies 1K. Oh, I'm going to upload a JPEG. Now it's 3.1K. I mean, 3 megabytes and 1K. And now you've got a million rows. Never use blobs. Blobs serve only one purpose, as if you need to put in text into your database and you want it stored in its original bytes that was transmitted to you. So, for example, one of our registration systems uses blobs at my day job because we have tons of different languages that hit it and it happens to be running on a really old server that doesn't handle UTF-8. Like, it's really, really old. So, it only handles Latin character sets. But if we need someone coming in, punching in their stuff in Japanese, we need to store the Japanese. Therefore, we're using a blob to store. We're storing the bytes that represent the Japanese and not the actual Japanese character. We're storing it in its raw data format so that later on we can read those bytes back out and say, we know this was Japanese. Put it on the screen because it'll redraw it exactly the same. Um, text. MySQL's actually got three text types, tiny text, text, and big text. Um, it just changes how many characters it can hold. Every database server has something called text or memo in Microsoft's case. It literally doesn't have, have a limit how much text it can hold. There's just huge amounts of text. Um, and there's enum and sets. Nobody, almost nobody uses those. Uh, those are set in the data, in the application. So out of these data types, which ones are important? Uh, date, time. Var car, car, maybe text, and then integers and booleans. And um, as you can see in here, it was never even mentioned, but decimals, those are the big ones. All right, so now we got our table coming up again. And we've now assigned data types, null statuses. We've now basically got a physical design. It is a physical design targeted to in this case, Microsoft SQL Server, because there's an nvarcar in there. That's Microsoft SQL Server specific. Um, but now we have, you know, primary key of employee number. It's int. It's not null. Uh, varcar, car, nvarcar, date. You know, those kinds of data types. Okay, so we can set up default values, and depending on the database server, we can actually put in logic. Um, I'm going to put it out right now. MySQL does not have, handle logic in its default values. Um, systems like Postgres and Oracle Microsoft SQL Server, yes. You can actually put in logic to determine the default value. So in this case, they go item number. It's a surrogate key. Default value is a surrogate key. That means it auto increments. It goes up automatically. Category has no default. An item prefix. If it's category perishable, then it starts, it's going to prefix it with a P. It's always going to be set to P, I, O, or N. So if it's imported, prefix with I, 1, O. Um, approving department, if the prefix is I, it goes to shipping and purchasing. Otherwise, it's just purchasing. And shipping method is, if item prefix is P, it goes next day. Otherwise, it goes to ground. We can actually get the database to do a lot of this logic automatically. Um, the issue is that a lot of modern applications do it itself because you can code the application to handle all these logic. And if you need suddenly add a new category and then you need to add the right prefix and you need to do that, you actually have to modify the database structure. Whereas you could just update the application and then you know the next update, you just update the application without any database downtime. It's Something you can do, it's not always a good thing to do, but it's something you can do. Okay, data constraints. Data constraints are limitations on data values. So a domain constraint, I think we talked about domain constraints last week. It limits the column to a particular set of values. In other words, if it's gonna be email address, field called email address, it's gonna hold email addresses and only email addresses. It's a business rule saying, Email field will hold email addresses. Rage constraints. Um, you can actually set a rule saying um, the value in this numeric field must always be greater than zero. You add an item to an order and you say quantity zero. Well, 
Is that a valid item that you can sell if you're selling zero, but you put it on the order anyways? Therefore, a range constraint would be, must be at least one. Um, interrelational constraints, um, that's for foreign keys. In other words, the values of this column, uh, intra, intra, intra and interrelational. Intra means the value of one column is determined by the value of another column in the same table. That's these rules right here. Those are intra. In other words, when you add the item, based on the category, all the other items will cascade on it. Um, interrelational constraints limits a column's value to a value from another table, also known as a foreign key. Now, let's talk about uh, relationships. And this is pretty much the same uh, you experienced before. Um, so when you have a one-to-one -one relationship between strong entities, the you can put the primary key of one entity into the other entity as a foreign key, and it really doesn't make a difference which way you do it. Because when they're both strong entities and it's a one-to-one -one relationship, it absolutely makes no difference which one has the primary key and which one has the foreign key. You can see, like if you look at this example over here, you'll see that the first example, the membership number is input the locker in, in with the lockers. In the second example, they put the locker number in with the membership. Because each member can only ever have one locker and one locker can only ever belong to one member, it makes no difference where you put the foreign key, it's just a design, design decision. So when you're doing this initial design, if they're both strong entities, who cares? That being said, depending where you work, they may have rules about which one, which goes where. Um, they may have priorities on the different entity, like the different tables. Like a club member is probably a more important entity than the locker. Therefore, the importance, the important entities primary key is the one that becomes the foreign key in the other one. Other companies just don't care. Um, it is what it is. Um, in one to many, you'll take the primary key from the parent table, put it in as a foreign key in the child table. Like such. So a club member has uh, many club uniforms and it will bring in so at the top is the conceptual diagram. The bottom is the physical diagram. Uh, when you're doing the conceptual, you don't have the foreign keys. When you do the physical and logical, the foreign keys exist. So in this case, the member number is the parent. The member is the parent table. So we take the mem member number. We put it in the club uniform table as a foreign key. It's not participating as a primary in the primary key because they're strong entities. But you'll see that the member number is down here as an attribute. This is saying that Whenever we insert or update a row in club uniform, the values in the member number must be a valid value from members. You can't put in a fake member number. So if you get member number 55 and you put in 600 and 600 does not exist, it will say no. 600 does not exist in the member tables. The basically the value of member number must exist in the members table, otherwise it will not work. That's known as a foreign key constraint. And then we got the many to many between strong entities. Many to many is uh, the one that a lot of people have a hard time with um, when they're first starting out because conceptually and logically, you can have many to many. When you go to the physical diagram, physical database server, like real database servers, there's no such thing as many to many. It's physically impossible to do many to many. Um, modern database servers will not let you do it. So how do you solve it? How do you solve many to many? And we've got the example, a company may supply many parts, a part might be supplied to many companies. So therefore a part is a strong entity, a company is a smart, strong entity, and they both operate in many to many. So what you do is you create what they call an intersection table. And it will store data about the corresponding rows from each entity. The intersection table consists of only of the primary keys of each table, and it'll make a composite 
primary key that is also a foreign key. It'll look like this. So we got a many and many at the top and company part number. So how do you resolve it? You create a new table that becomes a child. And it, in it will be the foreign keys that point to the primary keys of each of the parent tables. But those foreign keys are also participating in the primary key. So it is a composite primary key that is also foreign keys. Um, I usually do this with a pantomime to explain how it actually happens. So when you see a many to many in the diagram, it looks like this, right? You got the crow's foot at each end. When you're resolving it, the crow's foot must point to something on the middle. So the parents are one, the child is many. So you go from many to many to many pointing at a single thing with ones on the outside, which is what this is doing. Is it's showing that the company has zero or one company part. The part has one or more parts listed, but the relationship going from company part to its parents is one mandatory one. In other words, each row is a combination of the two. And it, that combination only ever appear once in that table. There are some limitations on this. Um, and I'll explain that in a few minutes, I hope. Um, so the foreign keys are placed and it becomes an ID dependent intersection table. In other words, the intersection table is ID dependent on the parents at that point, because it's a super weak entity. It can't exist without the primary keys of its parents. All right. Uh, uses for ID-dependent entities um, may represents many-to-many. -many. Uh, it'll represent association relationships, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, also storing multi-valued attributes. And um, archetype and instance relationships, that's a topic we're not even going to touch, so pretend that line doesn't exist. All right, so we just talked about an intersection table. An intersection table holds a relationship between two strong entities that are uh, participating many to many. It contains only the primary keys of the two entities. That's it, that's all. That's all it has. But often, that's not enough. Usually we use something called an association table. So it is an intersection table plus extra columns. It has extra stuff in it. And we'll go and draw it like this. And I'm only going to worry about the bottom one. Like that. So we got our partner company. Well, we flip the tables around, but you know, it doesn't make a difference. And we have a quote. So you got a part number, company name, and then we added an attribute of price. So it's saying that when this part is being sold to this company, this is the quoted price we sell it at. Because Different companies will pay a different price for the same part. For example, I can guarantee that Canadian Tire pays a lot less for their brake pads than um, Capital Auto Parts does. Because Capital Auto Parts is just a single company that buys auto parts. Therefore, they don't have the purchasing power of Canadian Tire for their brake pads. Therefore, they're going to be quoted a higher price than Canadian Canadian Tire gets, gets the brake pads for cheaper because they're doing more volume. So this thing, we can have the extra price on here. Uh, and this works great for a lot of cases. So uh, another example of that, actually, when I show you guys how to do some of this stuff in MySQL Workbench, time permitting, Ooh, it's getting tight, time permitting, um, I'll show you guys some of the alternatives that we can do with this. And this feels like it's not so, there we go. Um, this is just showing a three-way association. So we've got three entities happening here. We've got a client, an architect, and a project. They're all feeding into an assignment. There's three parts of the primary key, and then a single entry for the hours worked. It's just, you know, you can show that 
the intersection table, or in this case, the associative entity, or the associative table can have multiple columns in it and they serve you know, purposes. Okay, designing for maximum cardinality. So we got um, one to one, many to one, or one to many. Um, I mean, mandatory, so optional, optional, mandatory, optional, optional, mandatory. Uh, mandatory, mandatory means the parent and the child are mandatory. Um, we'll use the term action to mean the minimum cardinality enforcement action. For one to one relationship, there's no actions that need to be taken. So, for enforcing minimum cardinality, when you do an insert, there's nothing on the parent. You have to get a parent. If you don't have the parent, you're not allowed to insert. So, that's on a one to many relationship. Um, modify the key or the foreign key. You have to change the child's foreign key to match the new value. It's known as a cascade update. Most database servers prohibit it. Um, because you can't rename the primary key of a table. You're not supposed to. So it's not going to allow it to happen because it'll ca trigger what they call a cascade update. In other words, you change the primary key of the parent, that means you got to change the primary keys of the kids too. Um, if you're just changing it on the child table, that's cool as long as the parent already exists. The child's being adopted by another by another record. That's essentially what that means. Um, delete. If there are child records, you're not allowed to delete the parent. Otherwise, if it's a child, there's no limit. You can kill the kid and leave the parent standing. That's cool. But you can't kill the parent until you've gotten rid of the kids too. It's just how it works. Um, don't worry too much about these slides. I've never seen them on the test. I just have to go through them. I'll just be honest. Um, so if it's a mandatory child, mandatory optional parent, uh, you'd get a child, you'd prohibit it because realistically it's impossible to have a child record without, without a parent. Uh, you can modify the key or the foreign key, update the foreign key of the child. Uh, that would also be prohibited. Um, if you're modifying the foreign key, if it's not the last child, that's cool. Uh, if it's the last child, prohibit. Um, delete, there's no limitation on the parent, but it's not last child, that's okay. So, it's a sample designed for data on several companies. You got a company of phone contacts, departments, and employees. And we're going to talk about cascading updates and deletes. Actually, I don't remember why this slide is in here. Cascading updates and deletes. Cascade updates occur when a change to the parent's primary key is applied to the child's foreign key. Surrogate keys never change, so there's never a need for cascading updates. Which is why surrogate keys are good. If you're using something stupid as your primary key, such as a phone number. So the parent record has the phone number as the primary key. You add a couple of child records. You're going to carry the parent's phone number into each of the child records. Then suddenly you find out you need to change the phone number. You can't change the child unless the phone number already exists. And you can't change the phone number because there's child records. You get into what they call a chicken before the egg situation. So technically, you get stuck in a situation where you can't actually do it. It's literally called an update lock. You can't update because chicken before the egg, which one happened first? The way it's been handled in the past is you take the original record, copy it, add a new record with that number, the new number on it, update all the child records so it's pointing to that new record and then delete the original record. Or you could have used a surrogate key and you wouldn't have had this problem. Cascading deletes occur when child rows are deleted along with the deletion of a parent row. Uh, on strong entities, generally, you do not cascade. So, for example, you delete a, a student, you don't want it to delete the locker. So, you're not going to do a cascade update, a cascade delete, because that's just bad. For weak entities, generally, you do cascades. Uh, intersection tables, for example, you'd cascade delete. So, 
you delete the customer, you want to delete all the things that have to do with that customer. So it would get rid of all the intersection things that have to do with that customer. Um, and here I'm going to put in a piece of real world knowledge. Never do cascade deletes. That's it. Never do it. Why? Because there's always a risk you're going to damage things that you shouldn't damage. For example, if you have a financial system and you have transactions and suddenly you delete the customer and it cascades and deletes all the transactions, suddenly you have money that magically shows up in your bank account and you have nothing in your system to prove where that money came from. That's called fraud. Yes, there's a couple of ways, there's techniques. Uh, there's the option to make it, you literally could add an active field, like a Boolean, active or not, deleted, true, false. So you would delete the record, mark it as deleted, and the application just, whenever it's pulling up data, it just says where deleted equals false. Therefore, it's a, what's known as a soft delete, where you make it go away, but the data is still there. Therefore, the financial records will still add up. It's just the, you know, the data entry person does need to know about this customer that we fired. But we still need to know that we took the customer's money or we paid them money. Exactly. So you can't delete it if something's related. So you make it inactive. And there's a few, like I said, there's a few techniques to do it. There's a Boolean as deleted or not. Um, I prefer using a timestamp. It was deleted at this time on this day. And any anytime that timestamp is not null, I pretend it's deleted. That way we know when it got deleted. Because <laughs> sometimes that's a really important piece of information. When did the schmuck delete that record? And then we realize, oh, it wasn't the right one being deleted. So now we got to recover it. How do you recover it? You set the timestamp field back to null. And suddenly the record's alive again. There's ways of handling it. So from a pure business point of view, never cascade delete. Um, you only cascade deletes on things that are not important. And if you ask anybody in business, data, if you collected it, you had a reason why you collected it, you might need it one day. Businesses are data hoarders. They just accumulate data. Whether they need it or not, they like to have it in case they ever need it. Like the company I work for right now, we've been collecting certain metrics for uh, device driver downloads because we write printer drivers. That's one of our big business pieces. We write printer drivers for other people's printers so they don't have to use that printer, printer drivers. So we have a nice big, somebody buys a nice expensive HP latex 48 inch wide printer. So a printer that's like, you know, that wide prints with latex ink. But most of you in this room have probably never even heard of such a thing. Uh, it stinks when it prints, but you can print a poster, put it in the sun for five years and it won't fade. It's used for signage. Anybody here have an HP printer? Anybody here ever experienced how shitty their drivers are? You know, one day the printer says, hey, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And the printer driver goes, no. We, the company I work for, we write drivers to bypass the manufacturer's drivers on these large format printers so we can force it to print nicely. We're known for how good our color red is. Believe it or not, red's like one of the hardest colors to print. Our company is known for how good our reds are. What a weird thing to be proud of, eh? We make good reds. We have consistent reds, I should say. Like, no matter what media you put into the printer, as long as you tell the print job what media you're using, the red will look the same regardless of what you're putting through the printer. It's cool. We've been tracking downloads on this for years. Nobody's ever asked us for some data. Suddenly, uh, two weeks ago, one of the managers says, I'd really like to know, you know, how many people downloaded our Canon drivers plotted across time for the last five years. We go, well, we don't have five years. We've got three years worth of data. And, you, and he says, but not only that, I want to know by country. So he wanted to know over the years, across the countries, which countries downloaded the most printer drivers of, for Canon. 
And we had that data. We'd been hoarding that data for years. Nobody had ever asked for it. We just, somebody said, it'd be a good idea if we collect this stuff. So this is an example of never delete data because it's kind of handy to have. Uh, actions to apply, uh, apply in, to enforce minimum cardinality. Um, you got, you know, one to one, many to one, one to many, many to many. So when it's one to one, you don't have to need to do anything. Uh, many to one parent required reactions. Uh, many to one is easily enforced by the database. It's basically referential integrity constraints. If you make the foreign key not null, it means that you can't delete the parent. The foreign key must exist. Uh, one to many, uh, there's some child actions required. It is actually hard to enforce when uh, the parent is the child is mandatory on the parent, and you end up using something called triggers. Or actually, the application to take care of it because realistically, database servers can't do that. Um, when it's mandatory on both sides, it's almost impossible to impossible to maintain. It's the applications are going to do it. So, by what I mean when I say that the child is mandatory and the parent is optional, the parent is optional. When you put records in a database, they go in in sequence. So if you say, I cannot add this parent unless it has a child. How can you add the child if the parent doesn't exist yet? So as you're saying, I want to insert a parent, but a child, the child is mandatory. We cannot have a child unless this parent, this parent record cannot exist without a child record. So how are you going to make that happen? You can't insert two records at the same time. It's impossible. Therefore, it's, that's what it's saying here. It's difficult to enforce because realistically it can't be done. So the way it works is you insert the parent, then you insert the child. That's the exact same way as you do, you know, one to many optional because you can create the parent without any child records. You create the parent with a child record. It's still, the child is going to be optional forever, which will lead me to... Um, Lab four. Is that right? Unless we've replaced it, I got to go double check in case I'm lying. Uh, basically, no, not lab four. It's lab six. So after the break, mm -hmm. there's a diagram you're given. You're you're told create the database by hand. You're going to type in the command section create the database. You're going to learn about it after the break. With MySQL. No matter how well you just you did the code by hand, it would never come back to what the diagram looked like originally, because it had the mandatory parent, mandatory like optional parent, mandatory child thing, and it's impossible to do that. So whenever you reverse engineer the diagram, the diagram will never look like what the, the original design said because it's impossible. You can design it; it's not going to enforce it. So, yeah, that's that. Okay, what time is it? Six three. Okay, so what I am going to do is the example I was going to do, showing you guys how to use MySQL Workbench. Um, the lab is cool. You'll be able to do it in the lab for lab four. Right now you're working on lab three, so it's not so bad. Um, at the start of next week's lecture, I'm going to go through the samples with MySQL Workbench on how to actually do the diagramming and stuff. Um, I fully realize that lab four is going to get released basically this week to you guys and it's supposed to be happening in lab. Um, I will go and look at my previous lectures. Hope I remember. Somebody called me out if I don't put include this in the announcements, but I'm gonna go look at one of my older lectures and see if I did it in one of my older lectures so you guys can see how it's done. So you can say, oh, by the way, if to do this lab, I'm gonna go look at you know this lecture for three minutes. So I'll provide the YouTube link with the right timestamp link. If I, you don't see it in the announcement, one of you, I don't care who, send me an email saying, hey, Dan, you fucked up. You forgot to include the sample. If I can't find one, I will actually put it in the announcement saying, hey, guys, I couldn't find it. Okay? But if, I don't, if you don't see me saying, hey, I didn't find it, that's because I forgot to look it up because I'm going to get home tonight at like 9.30 and I'm going to be really tired. <laughs> so... But I will try, if nothing else, I'll update the announcement within 24 hours with the appropriate link. Okay, guys.
that was the end of today's um, nice and long lecture.